time and time again, I am just so impressed with what the retro modding community is creating. And the project we're gonna talk about today is no exception. This is the Retro Light CM4, a completely custom DIY emulation handheld that has been designed from the ground up. From the internal circuitry, to the custom battery, all the way to the shell, and powered with a Raspberry Pi CM4 at its core. While its exterior exhibits a few design nods to the switch light, the true magic lies within. Hey everyone, how's it going? My name is Tito and welcome to another episode of Retro Renew. Today I have a really awesome project that I want to show you, which honestly is pretty impressive. This is the Retro Light, an emulation handheld that's been built from the ground up and is powered by a Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4. Now I know I just recently covered another Raspberry Pi project in my last video, which if you haven't checked out, I highly recommend, but this one takes an entirely different approach. Whereas the PS Pi project from my last video utilizes a lot of the original hardware from an actual PSP console, every aspect of Retrolight has been designed from scratch, which if you think about is pretty darn ambitious. Oh, and did I mention that Retrolight has its own little smart dock featuring a tiny little display? It's awesome. Anyway, the core of the design, i.e. its electronics, were done by the talented modder named Ben also known online as Stoned Edge, which if you've been watching my Japanese travel videos, he actually drove me around some pretty cool spots in Saitama to hunt for retro video games. Now, while Ben designed the sort of guts of retro light, the shell and the button controls were created by another modder by the name of CNC Dan. I definitely recommend that you follow these guys and I'll have all their information down below. All right, so in this video, I'll go over all the major parts that are required to build the retro light. Then I'll show you how to put it all together, go over all of its unique features, review the pros and cons, and of course provide you with my overall thoughts. So at the center of this project is the custom Retro Light mainboard, which will host the Raspberry Pi CM4 module. We also have these two controller boards, which have most of the buttons and switches used for the console. And here are the cast resin buttons. While I did use these for the initial install, I ended up swapping them out for the beautifully machined brass ones but we'll get into that later on in the video. And here, Ben actually designed a fully custom lithium ion battery made specifically for the retro light, which is pretty awesome. And since this project overclocks the Raspberry Pi to squeeze as much performance out of it as possible, Ben also designed this beefy heatsink, which first of all looks amazing, and second of all should perform really nicely at pulling heat away from the CPU. I mean, look at this thing, it's absolutely gorgeous. And of course, you'll need a Raspberry Pi CM4 like this one here. Now, there were quite a few other parts in this kit which actually came all super nicely packaged in this really professional looking box. I filmed an entire unboxing sequence, but unfortunately lost the footage. However, you will be able to see the remaining parts during the installation tutorial. But before we jump into that, let's talk about the sponsor of today's video, iFixit. If you've been following my channel for a while, you've probably noticed that I consistently rely on my trusty iFixit ProTech Toolkit for most of my mod videos. iFixit is on a mission to empower retro tech enthusiasts and DIYers, helping us breathe new life into our consoles and other electronic devices. Starting November 10th and running through December 18th, in a proactive effort to quell the impulse of purchasing shiny new gadgets and instead encouraging repairing the treasures that we already own, such as that vintage console that I know you've been longing to restore, iFixit is offering enticing bundles tailored for your needs. The Gamer Bundle is bound to captivate retro game enthusiasts with a backlog of consoles awaiting restoration. It features the remarkable Mana Toolkit, equipped with every driver bit you could possibly require, the Fix Mat, an absolute essential tool for keeping your screws organized during disassembly, is included too. You'll also receive a keycap removal tool, thermal paste for addressing that console with overheating issues, an anti-static brush for safely removing dust buildup from your circuit boards, a spudger retail pack for those tricky pry open situations, and some limited edition stickers and patches to proudly display your repair prowess. 
Moreover, when you purchase a bundle, you can utilize the promo code GAME10 to enjoy a generous 10% discount on a gaming console replacement part. So for all your electronic repairing needs, definitely check out iFixit using the link in the description below. And again, a huge thank you to iFixit for sponsoring this video. All right, now let's go ahead and put together the Retrolite CM4. All right, so to start things off, we need to grab the custom retro light battery and solder the included cable to it. Definitely refer to the GitHub instructions for this as you need to separate the four wires into two groups and solder them directly to the positive and negative terminals. You definitely need to get this step right or you can risk damaging the console. I think it'd be really great for the next iteration of this console that the cable is already connected to the battery. That would make this whole process a lot easier. And this is what it looks like when it's done, but I put some hot glue and capped on tape to insulate it, ensuring that there will be no shorting out inside the console. Next, we'll start to work on the main board. The only thing we need to do here is connect the left and right speakers to their corresponding pads on the board. Now let's prep the CM4. We'll start off by applying the perfect amount of thermal paste followed by placing on the beautifully machined heatsink. Man, this thing just looks beautiful. Now flip the pie over and secure the heatsink with the four included machine screws. Be sure to employ the start method as to apply even pressure over the CPU. Here you can see just how well engineered the heatsink is, making great contact with the Pi's IHS. Very nice. Now we can go ahead and connect the CM4 to the retro light mainboard via the dual mezzanine high roast connectors. It just neatly snaps into place. Next, we'll grab the absolutely beautifully crafted front shell and drop in the included IPS display. I really just can't stress how beautifully this machined shell is made. With the display in place, we can now install the mainboard, making sure to feed the LCD ribbon cable through the integrated pass-through. Then go ahead and connect the LCD ribbon cable to the main board. Next, we'll go ahead and install the triggers, which are held in place with these two screws. Once that's done, we'll begin to populate the buttons, membranes, and switch style analog sticks. You'll notice that these are all cast resin buttons, which I later replaced with machine brass ones, but the process to install them is exactly the same. I then placed a piece of double-sided tape to the back of the analog stick to help keep it firmly in place. But I would have rather used screws. Not sure why it was decided to use this method for securing the sticks. Next, go ahead and connect the analog stick ribbon cables to the controller boards. And then connect each controller PCB to the main board using the included ribbon cables. Once the controller boards are installed, we can go ahead and assemble the left and right acoustic chambers, which come in three pieces and will house the speakers. Then follow the same procedure for the other side. Now we can drop in the power and volume button board, which I use some double-sided tape to help keep it secured to the ledge as shown. Then plug it into the main board. And then go ahead and slot in the buttons. 
Next, drop in the battery and plug it in. Grab the internal fan and then plug that in. We'll temporarily place it below the heatsink. Now we're gonna go ahead and prep the rear shell by installing these air inlet filters. Including these with the kit is a really nice touch. And you'll notice here that my rear shell already came with the R2 and L2 triggers installed. Now integrated into the rear shell are these three pegs, which need to be aligned with the internal fan as these are what secure it in place. So place on the final button membranes for L2 and R2, and then drop in the rear shell, ensuring that the pegs align with the fan and that there are no wires being pinched. Once that's done and the rear shell is secured, the retro light is complete. What I really find incredible about the retro light is just how much effort went into this project. And even more impressive is that it was two people during their spare time who did it. To make something as polished as this from scratch is just absolutely incredible. And like I said earlier in the video, I'm just constantly blown away by the retro modding community. Anyway, with the retro light all put together, let's go over all of its features. First, let's talk about the form factor. The retro light feels very familiar and comfortable in the hands, and that's because it definitely borrowed quite a few styling cues from the Switch light, and that's not a bad thing. This particular build with the aluminum shell and brass buttons just feels ultra premium. Ben and CNC Dan even put my logo on the back, and it just looks absolutely exquisite. And these hex screws really round out the premium look of the exterior. Ben also made some units in a very cool, fantastic light translucent plastic, which looks equally great. Anyway, taking a look at the bottom of the retro light, we have quite a bit going on. Starting at the center, we have a USB-C port, which is used to charge the console. It was designed to use a Nintendo Switch power brick, but it should work with any 5-volt charger. And right next to it is a mini HDMI port for video output. Both these ports interface with the dock, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Here we have the micro SD card slot, which is where all the games and system files are stored. And lastly, stereo sound comes from these two down firing speakers here. Around top, we see the heat exhaust vents, headphone jack, power and volume buttons, and the double stack triggers, which all look very similar to the layout of the Nintendo Switch Lite. And at the front of the console, we have a 800 x 480 IPS display. And while the thick bezels do look a bit dated, the screen itself is fantastic. It's bright, the viewing angles are actually really good, and most importantly, games look great on it. Ben also programmed some on-screen graphics for the battery level as seen in the top left-hand corner of the screen, which also indicates when it's being charged. Additionally, you can see the volume level, as well as the on-screen brightness, which is adjusted by holding down the square select button and pressing up or down on the D-pad. Again, it's these little details that really bring the whole project together. And by pressing and holding the square select button with R3, you can access Ben's custom menu, which allows you to look at detailed battery information, calibrate the controls to your liking, access an on-screen virtual keyboard, and more settings unique to the battery and UI color scheme. Overall, this is a solid, beautiful looking handheld that lets you play an assortment of emulators. Now, moving on to the dock, this is where things truly go above and beyond. This thing connects to the retro light via the mini HDMI and USB-C port on the bottom, which means it can both charge the console and pass the video through to your television. Also, I'm not sure, but you may have noticed this attractive little one and a half inch color display front and center. When you first plug in the retro light, you get this nice little splash screen, which after a few moments showcases some system metrics such as temps, RAM usage, and more. But the coolest feature is when you load a game. As soon as you get a game up and running, the dock will display some cool artwork. But if you press this little orange button on the side, you can cycle through some other cool screens, such as the official cover art, info on the console you're playing with release date information for the game, metadata for the game that you're playing, and lastly, some more information about the game itself. While this is all superfluous and completely unnecessary, I absolutely love it. And the last feature on the dock are these three USB ports on either side, which are used for connecting controllers. I've been testing this unit out with wired controllers, but I wouldn't be surprised if you could hook it up with a wireless controller that uses a USB dongle. 
But regardless, the fact that Ben went through the trouble of designing this really unique take on a dock speaks volumes to the dedication he has to this project. The dock itself is a very cool companion to the handheld and adds to the overall grandness of this project. Anyway, moving our attention back over to the console, Ben created a custom RetroPie image, which supports quite a few emulators, with the upper end of support being the Nintendo 64 and PlayStation Portable. It does also support the Sega Dreamcast, but unfortunately I couldn't get it to run on my particular unit. Here's some footage of the gameplay on a few of the emulators, but feel free to skip ahead if you want. Great, now that we went over the RetroPie's key features, let's talk about the pros and cons of this project. Starting with the pros, I wanna first say that this thing just looks fantastic. Longtime viewers of the channel know that I have a soft spot for metal consoles, and this thing feels fantastic in the hands. I also think it's awesome that both Ben and CNC Dan designed this handheld to support an overclocked CM4 as it really pushes the limits of what emulators it can support. While I couldn't get Dreamcast games to run, it does appear to be supported per the GitHub, and also I do have footage that Ben provided of it running on his retro light. Other things I really like about the project are the cool little touches like the animated retro light splash screen, as well as the custom dashboard which mimics that of a Nintendo Switch. And the dock, we gotta talk about the dock. This thing adds to the overall grandeur of the project, even though it's not strictly necessary. But what things worth having in life are? And the last pro is that this project is open source, so you can essentially go ahead and make your own right now, and even contribute to the project if you'd like. However, if you feel building one of these is a bit out of your comfort zone, Ben does on occasion offer commissions for custom builds. So definitely make sure you follow him on Twitter. Anyway, those are the pros. But now, let's get into the cons. Now I do have to caveat the cons, as this project is constantly being improved upon. In its current state, it does have some issues and bugs that need to be worked out. But I don't want to take away from the tremendous amount of work that the team has put into the Retro Light, which is essentially a passion project that both Ben and CNC Dan work on during their free time. Alright, now that I have that out of the way, let's talk about the first con. The buttons. While all the face buttons and analog sticks feel great, the buttons along the top of the console need a bit of work. The power and volume buttons, while they do work, have almost no travel distance, making it difficult to tell whether or not they're being pressed. I often feel like I have to exert quite a bit of force to get them to register. And the trigger buttons don't really instill a lot of confidence. They feel a bit sloppy, especially the L2 and R2 triggers. I'm almost unsure how they're supposed to be pressed. Is it down here, or is it up here? I think they just need a bit of work. Now I do want to preface that the button feel most likely has to do with the fact that I opted for the machined metal ones. While they look fantastic, Ben also makes these out of cast resin, which I'm told feels much better. However, I am unable to confirm that from my own experience. Another con has to deal with the custom version of RetroPie, as well as the interface with the dock. While these look great and pretty much work as you'd expect, there are a few quirks I've noticed during my time with the console. For example, if the battery level is too low, the controls won't load at all, and you'll need to wait for there to be adequate charge in the battery in order for the buttons to register. Not that huge of a deal. Also, the battery level indicator sometimes doesn't reflect the true level, and you'll need to reset the console to get an updated reading. Again, this seems to go away once the battery has an adequate level of charge. And lastly, the integration of the retro light with the dock seems to be a bit buggy at the moment. For example, the controls appear to work sometimes, like in the menu, but when I get into a game, only a few buttons work, or none work at all. This doesn't happen all the time, and it appears to be on a game-to-game -game basis, as I've gotten it to work perfectly fine as well. I really do love the dock and the cute little display that it has, and think it's a really cool feature. The overall experience is pretty good, but there are a few hiccups here and there that I really do hope the team can address. Also, in order to get HDMI video out, you need to reset the unit. 
It's not quite as seamless as a Nintendo Switch, where you can switch between the handheld and dock mode on the fly. But honestly, let's be real here. For such an ambitious project, I mean literally building a handheld console from scratch, things work relatively well. This is pretty much a two-person team, and they are really trying to implement a lot of cool features into this project, and honestly, I'm here for it. Retrolight is most certainly a work in progress, and as things mature, I really do think it can be an amazing emulation handheld. There are just a couple hardware and software things that need to be worked out. Which actually brings me to the future of this project. As we enter a new generation of affordable single board computers, Ben is already hard at work on the next iteration of the Retro Lite, which will utilize the Rock Chip RK3588, which should be capable of handling 3DS, PlayStation 2, and GameCube emulation. While this new iteration of Retro Lite is in the works, Ben is able to leverage a lot of what he learned from the CM4 version and make the next generation of this amazing DIY emulation handheld even better. Well, there you have it, the Retro Lite CM4, an absolutely beautiful and ambitious custom Raspberry Pi based emulation handheld. Now, if you enjoyed this video, I really think you'll like this one here, so check it out. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you again next Thursday.